my next question concerns the late President Talbot, William R. Talbot, and the coup of 1980. Um, you just stated here that he was a sacrificial lamb for the sins of his class. I hope I'm quoting you to correctly. Equally so, other witnesses who testified before you, like Councillor Chia Chibu, former Chief Justice of Liberia, stated that he thought President Talbot um, was a good man and his death, that he sustained an unnecessary death. Um, Mr. Oscar Kuya testifying also alluded to Talbot's um, goodness. Um, I think it was him or one of them stated that they thought President Talbot was the most progressive president. Dr. Sawyer was also here and he thought that Talbot was a good president. So based upon um, all of these assertions from all of you, will it be proper then to assume here that President Holbrook was probably misunderstood and so now he's been validated in, the, in his death? You know, maybe I should say a few things about how I come my conclusions about Torben. I didn't meet uh, President Torben until I got to the university as a student leader. And one of our first interactions was something that had happened on campus. And then the president sent for us. First, we had issued a statement at some point we we'll issue a statement and I'm going to be, have an extended answer to tell you about experiences with the class of leaders that we interacted with, you know, so if you don't mind. One of the experiences was going to the University of Liberia board meeting where we're talking about um, some things about increases in the and some conditions at the university, basically. And the, then Bernard Blamo was president. I wasn't the president of the student union. In fact, it was J.D. Zagato Koto, who is the current minister of, of education, who was the president. And I was chairing the foreign relations committee at the time. And, but the board had invited us, and we went into this room. And the thing was that we had issued a statement in which we use the word demand the government. And they were very, very angry. How could we use such words? Like demand of the visitor, the president. So they were very angry on behalf of President Torben. Yet, the word that was coming from the mansion through his security and stuff was that the president would like to see us. He wasn't sending police on us. But when we went into the room of the university board, now the board of that, the board of trustees of the university had on it Richard Abram Harris, who was the speaker. He was president of the board. Frank Emmanuel Torbert, who was president pro tempore, was a member. And you just named them from the legislature. So whenever you appear before the board, you were appearing before the government. And as we entered this room, and the delegation included um, J.D. Koto, Dusty, there was um, Hadina Smite, and somebody else. And as we entered the room, all these old men, I guess that's what was our first time in this type of setting. So they terrified us. And you know very well those days. You know, people used, I, I, when I was growing up, I thought being a government official meant to be old and ugly. So, so, so that was how, that's how I thought, to be a member of the house and be this, to be old and ugly. So you go into this room and these old men, all of them sitting down like, you know, and so then as we entered, the um, 
The man said, hey, gentlemen, where are you? Who are you? you? Are you students? Because we went, they were talking, so we tried to sit down, and they ordered us up, and then they gave us the riots act to start with. And then they went, they interviewed, you, where are you from? What's your name? And, and JD now, he has started, he spent a long, long time in America now, so his English changed a little bit. But that time, when he spoke, he, he had a very deep accent from Nimba, from a uh, manor accent. So he said, my name is JD Kotoko. They said, what? <laughs> Where are you from? He says, he says, Richard Henry went through the, the interrogation. He said, from Nimba County. He says, Nimba country? He said, yes, sir. Oh, I remember Nimba country. When I was supervisor of schools, I used to go from town to town, and those people are strong. They used to carry me in a hammer. They carry me in a this and that, that. Now, we are students of the university who are now being saying this thing was bad. But he didn't, you know, he didn't say it like out of hatred. He was saying exactly what he used to do. And then he goes on to the next person. Oh, where are you? Uh, communist, we say. Communist? What a boy is this with such a name? I said, no, not communist. Communist, communist, we say. We say, oh, group, I mean. Oh, all right, okay, all right. We did, they move on to the next person. And such and such. Now, these things are imprinted in the minds of young people you're talking to. You, say, oh, you mean, these people still think they're going to be riding our heads? Then the president sent for us. In the meeting, with, in one of those meetings, the president will sit and say, Oh, you are my precious jewels. You gotta behave yourselves. You know, I mean, this is how you would talk to us. Now go back and go to your lessons. And you know, even though some others would have been so angry, the security people would have been so angry. And you know, I can name a whole lot of experiences of this sort. April 14. April 14, when it happened, and as I told you, there were the five names posted all over the place as the ring leaders. That was John Stewart, who is a member of your committee, the commission. James Yazia, he's working with an NGO here. It's Oscar Quia, Bacchus Matthews, and myself. Five names with posters, $5,000 reward, wanted dead or alive. We were named as the ring leaders. And the first people to turn themselves in was John Stewart and myself. When they were looking for us, we had been in a place in hiding. It happened, and I can say that today. And that is why, again, that not us, that people don't look at the struggles from the Congo and country perspective. We were in hiding in the home of Kenneth Best's sister, whose boyfriend or partner had a different point of view about what we were doing. And then he would come into the house while we were, and this woman was hiding us there. And they would come and they would, with his friends, and they would be talking about how Torbert is a weak man. They could have dealt with these young men, and she would join them. Yeah! Yeah! Do that! They should but we were there, in the house with this woman, protecting us for nearly two weeks. As so many of the other people looking for us, when the Guinean planes were flying all over the place, we were there. Abba Put came and said to us, young man, you cannot run away from the law. You can't run away from the law. Go and turn yourselves in. And after pondering, we wrote a letter, punch our fingers and sign it with our blood, and send it to Torben, that we were coming to turn ourselves in. And Tomo Reeves, Abba Port, uh, probably George Brown, I don't remember, Bishop, Reverend Tomo Reeves, Dr. Sawyer, and they took us in to Torben. When we 
got into the executive mansion office, I mean the entire cabinet and the key leaders of the legislature were there. It was a room full of these men. It was intimidating. And that was the first time we were hearing Tobert telling his story about what had happened. This man had been led to believe that we were communists who had come from Cuba and brought into the country Russians and Cubans, brought drugs and gave drugs to all these people who were demonstrating in the streets. And that we were so dangerous. Particularly, Dustin Wolokoli had gone to Benin to an international students' meeting and had come back to join me and others at Cottington, where we were holding the first Congress of Lensu. We had, re we had organized Lensu, reorganized Lensu into what we now call Lensu, and having the Congress at Cottington. When Dusty had returned with our international guests, who we had informed the governor about, one of whom was a Russian, two were from Senegal. And the government gave us a car and a bus, and we had a university bus that was on the radio. Um, Mr. Buya told you, yeah, that is a very true story, that we had gone to the Ministry of Information to help us publicize that meeting. So we were at Cottington. While at Cottington, we wrote a message on, the, on April 13th, wrote a message a cablegram to the president and said in the cablegram, which I signed, Mr. President, please allow the demonstration to take place. Let them exercise their democratic right to, to assemble peaceably, as the Constitution says. That was the message we sent to the president. It was that message that the security people or whatever may have turned around to say that indeed I had organized this. I was one of the ringleaders. Of course we came and met the president. And when everybody in that room wanted us eaten up, the president spent most of his time explaining what he had gone through. It was as if he was talking to a preacher. How he was so scared. How they were shooting near the mansion. He would see the fire and this and that. What he forgot was the shooting he heard was not by the demonstrators. They didn't have guns. It was his people. And yet with him in the mansion was Cowboy Johnson, who was the chief of staff. He sent for Cowboy and he says to us, I told Cowboy, I said, Cowboy, sit with me. My Vic, you sit with me. They got to kill us together. He was petrified. And as he told the story, he still showed how petrified he was. Yet he had been told that we had brought these communists to destabilize the country. He then went on to say that he had been told by the security people that in fact the meetings to organize the demonstration was held in Carwell, I mean in uh, Cruiserville, in the home of Arbor Port. It was at this time that Arbor Port jumped up and almost jump on the president. Mr. President, you have to prove it. I will sue you if you don't prove it. And then, Wilfred Clark and Massacre, and Massacre was the muscular guy who was the SS director, they were all in the room. They jumped between them to stop them. But Albert was emphasizing that he would sue the president. With all of that, all I'm saying, this man, for what he had gone through, was never angry enough to say, as others have done, go and kill them or do whatever. He just said, y'all just take them. Y'all take care of them. It was after we were turned in that Mr. Bacchus Matthews turned himself in, who had been actually the ringleader. And it was when we were at the central prison with Oscar Queer, the rest of the other people came and were brought in, some were arrested, some were brought there, but 
have we been there? It was there that, you know, we heard that Bacchus had written this letter in which he was appealing to the president for us to be set free and blah, 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 blah. But in that prison, there was a whole lot of debate that took place. Why was Bacchus taken to NSA in a nice room, in a hotel, I mean, it looked like a hotel, he was eating food from the restaurant and this and that. And there were those who felt, oh, but Bacchus is the godchild of President Tolkien. Oh, but you know, I mean, Bacchus is the son of a Congo man, or a Congo woman, or something, something of this sort. That's why, you see these people, and there's, I mean, all kinds of debates went on in the prison. While we were, why were we in another prison, on, in the murder cell, in one prison, and he was in another. But after all that had happened, I'm just showing you that side of Tolkien. He got backers to write a letter. And on the strength of the letter, the president re replied. I don't know whether many people have heard the language of the president. Let me just see what I can read. If, if, I think I came with a copy of that uh, letter. I hope I came. Yeah. If you have the time, let me read the letter that Marcus wrote. We, um, you are aware of it. Mr. Kuya will be testified. He read it. So if you have a copy of the president's response, that would be helpful. Okay, let me read the president's response. The president replied, this is President Corbin. This was this letter you used to write to everybody. The way you used to address people. Dear friends, this is to the man who had just led the demonstration. And this is on April 25th. This is what? How many days? 15 days. Just two weeks after the demonstration had taken place. The wound was still around. And the president wrote, Dear friend, I acknowledge with thanks your letter of today's date in which you express regrets on behalf of yourself and your collaborators and noted the dilemma which you, young people, now face as a consequence of the unfortunate events which occurred over the Easter weekend because of the action taken by you. I am delighted to know that you have now come to the understanding that wisdom is the principal thing according to the good book. When it comes to the reconstruction of our country, I have made it clear that I desire all the people of the country to participate in this national endeavor. This country is ours and we must together build it through total involvement self-reliance and a firm faith in Almighty God. This is the basis of my consistent policy for national development and progress, so that all our people might enjoy a higher standard of living. In this process, we must first of all reconstruct ourselves morally and spiritually. We must change our attitudes and our ideologies foreign to the Liberian way of life to enable us to physically reconstruct our country for the benefit of all of us. The governed must operate together with the government. You can rest assured that I shall give, you a, give your appeal timely consideration. With kindest regards at rally time, with faithfully yours in the cause of the people. William I mean, R. W. R. Torbert joined. This was the president's letter. I read it also to, to answer why many people have this view that in spite of some difficulties, he had a certain type of soberness. And it is that type of soberness that many of his class allies said they thought he was crazy. That Todman would not allow this. This is not the way to rule. People like this, Todman.
Ma would not allow them out. They would be in. They would, this would happen. This would happen. And because he had a different point of view, because he had an exposure, he had traveled around the world, probably traveled more than any other leader before him. And probably traveled more than many of the people in his government. And so he had a certain type of exposure, I believe, that made him to have certain type of tolerance. There were a few people within that group, I must say, that I personally interacted with. When the students at the university, when I was leader and were raising questions about development not being even, and there were Susuku projects that were going to the poor in, in Gubadi and in, in, uh, in, in Putu, James Phillips sent for us at the camp, on the campus sent for us to go to his home. He sat with us one night, told a story about how he came from school with a master's degree, started a farm in Bindi and this, that wonderful story. And then said, but well, you know, we're doing something which you don't know. Maybe I should take you around. So he organized one group of students to go to Lofa, another group to go elsewhere, to go to Grand Jire. And he personally said, since you are president, I want to take you personally to Grand Jire to see the projects that the government are undertaking, the, gov the government is undertaking. So he had his own private plane. And I guess that was the first time that I was using that small Cessna sitting with the minister. He flew me there. My delegation was there and we saw what it was. There was a certain type of openness within certain group within the leadership. Or the case of uh, the case of Cesar Dennis, who, when I was due to travel as president of Student Union, the foreign ministry refused to give me a, visa, a passport. They are taking my passport from the airport for no reason. He sent and said he wanted to see me, and said to me, "Look, young man, I can assure you." You have a right to carry a passport. No one should deny you a passport. In fact, since you're president of the student union, you're going to travel, we'll give you an official passport. He went further and said, you know, many of you don't know. You just bunch everybody together as Congo people. He said, my mother, something about his mother being by or something or something of that sort, he went on, told the story, and then says, my wife, Agnes Dennis, who was a professor at the university teaching us science, the dean of the science college. He said, that woman, that raw crew woman, my epa, she no Dennis, she no Cooper, she is a crew woman. The two sisters, we brought them here, they stay with some Coopers, and then they begin civilized. Now they can't speak crew. They act like they can't speak crew. So don't blame us. You blame your own people. They ain't want to speak your dialect. You know, I mean, we had different types of interactions. And everywhere we went, the respect with which people treated Torben and Cesar Dennis as our foreign minister was a pride to us. So I do not subscribe to a generalized description of people. And I say that those who believe that the old order was right and they must keep it may have been the dominant force. But it didn't mean that there were not people within the three party who had a different point of view, who wanted a change, certainly not keeping the things the way they are. And so when we say Torbert was a good man, it was, it's in that context. I think he belonged, as they would say, on the left of the true party. And in that process, he was despised by his own people. And to the others, he was slow, too slow. So he was caught in the middle. And people took advantage. Now, who killed him? I certainly don't believe that just by themselves alone, they had it. However, I can say that on April 14, when we were in detention, there was the view, and you will remember that while we were in detention, June 4th took place in Ghana. Earlier in May that year, Rollins tried to make a coup d'etat. 
or, or Kufua, who was a military fellow at the time, the military commander had come, had come to Liberia on a visit in May, because many leaders came to sympathize with Auburn, and Rawlings led the march troop, the, the guard parade that saw the president of and saw him in. And shortly after, there were some little rumors. On June 4th, Rollins made a coup. Young officers made a coup. Elsewhere, there have been such things happening. How those things impacted on this young group of fellows who used to play checkers in, uh, in um, uh, PHP together? How other people may have impacted on them? I don't know. And I'm not going to participate in the, the speculations. All I do know is that the system was so rotten and weak at foundation that it gets too little to push it. And it shows the weak party wasn't strong because just a little push, it fell. Not even by people who had command. The soldiers did not have a command. Because to have a command, you must be a commander who gave orders to your troop. How come? A sergeant who didn't have anything under him, except for probably eight men, would do something like this. 